Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's complimentary webinar from ICMI, Call Center Management on Fast Forward, The Trend Shaping Our Future, sponsored by Market Tools. I'm Christina Hammerberg, Associate Editor for ICMI, and I'm your host. We are on the cusp of a truly exciting time in the contact center right now, as we are witnessing the emergence of the most empowered customers in history. In today's presentation, we will define the trends shaping our future and the steps you can take now to prepare your organization, your team, and yourself for the new era of customer relationships. Before we begin, let's do some housekeeping. You can participate in today's webinar by asking questions at any time during the presentation. Just type your question into the Ask a Question box at the bottom right of the window, and be sure to click Submit when you're through. We will be answering these questions during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Take a moment now to disable your pop-up blockers if they're on. Also, you can learn more about our speakers by clicking on the Speaker Bios button located below the presentation window. The slides will advance automatically throughout the events. If you like, you may also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the Download Slides button, also located below the presentation window. If at any time during this presentation you experience technical problems, you can access the webcast help guide by clicking on the Help link below the media player. In addition, you can contact the Technical Support Helpline, and you can find that number in the help guide. And now, on with our program. Our speakers today are Brad Cleveland, Senior Advisor and former President and CEO of ICMI, and Greg Merrick. Vice President of Marketing for Market Tools Incorporated. Welcome, Brad and Greg, and thank you for being part of this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Great. Well, Brad, if you're ready, we can begin. Very good. Well, thank you very much, and thanks to each of you for joining us today. I'm excited about our time, and for all the challenges in the world, and there, are, there are plenty right now, this is the most exciting time yet in the development, most important time yet, in the development of customer services. We've really got a terrific opportunity to shape the, the experience that we're providing and really impact everybody, our customers, our employees, our organization, everybody who's a part of it. And it's great to be here with Market Tools. They've got a, a terrific story to tell. And, and I believe what they're doing is indicative of how call centers are being recognized for their strategic value and the impact that uh, we can really have when we capture and leverage and use voice of the customer. So I want to start just, just for a few minutes with a little bit of context. How has our perspective of customer service developed and changed in recent years? And if you go back a couple of decades, uh, kind of early 90s, mid 90s sort of time frame, we made a big leap forward. Until that time, we, 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 I don't want to, when I say we, I'm referring to, to, to uh, our profession and, and those of us in, in the contact center space specifically. And I don't want to make a big ex assumption or indict all of us, but there, there was kind of this perspective that an interaction is, is an interaction. It's kind of a singular event, and there, there's a cost to it. There may be some profit out of it. There, there, there's certainly a recognition that we're impacting customer satisfaction and, and our brand, but it wasn't a real formal sort of perspective. And we made a big leap forward when we began to look at customer lifetime value, began to realize that, hey, the, the, the job that we do in communicating and handling these interactions is going to impact whether someone's going to continue to do business with us or not. So that might be $500, might be $500,000, but uh, we began to put a number to uh, the, the larger impact we were having. And about that time, not, not soon thereafter, we began to study a related phenomenon. Well, they, they talk to each other, they, they talk to others as well. And the numbers in those days was often five to seven. You'd, you'd kind of hear that range. Uh, today, uh, as, as expected, with electronic communication and forums and email and feedback sites, uh, those numbers have grown. The, the latest studies say they'll, they'll tell an average of 16 others, uh, but uh, that can vary by millions. All of the United Breaks Guitars example on, on YouTube and other social examples that are out there. More recently, it's become clear that there's this whole new phenomenon taking shape that impacts our, our brand, our business results, our reputation with people who, in many cases, we've never had a direct interaction with. 
Um, and that's really where we are today. Uh, we're, we're being compelled to rethink service and the role of our contact center and how we're reaching and interacting with and building relationships with our customers. We all see these kinds of stats every day. They come out in lots of different, lots of different formats from lots of different sources. And the sheer numbers are amazing. Um, you know, over a trillion URLs uh, now. There's uh, over six billion global mobile phone subscribers. Facebook measures its adoption rate by uh, the usage by the, the adoption across the planet. Um, what percent of the planet's using the service? And you know, we, we, the 2.3 million blogs being added every day. There's something like 200 million out there that are readily accessible. And we try to get our arms around that. What, what's that mean to us? What's that mean in, in terms of customer service and delivering a, a great customer experience? Harris Interactive recently came out with a number that 82%, 82% of customers will tell others of a bad experience. And that's probably no surprise. I mean, we, we kind of intuitively know that's happening. And other, other research studies are coming up with similar sorts of numbers. And what I'm finding is that we often focus on uh, the, the downside and the risk in all of this as organizations. And I'd like to, you know, I'd like to suggest there's a huge upside to this. Um, I mean, it is really exciting to think of a brand that you love and they're probably designing a great product or service from the get-go, but they're, they're probably accessible, they're, they're listening, they're using what they're hearing to continually improve products and services and processes, and that's the opportunity that we have today. Some look at the sheer uh, numbers uh, behind social and mobile and uh, broadband and, and, and some of the things that are driving customer communication, and the whisper is, well, you, you kind of reach a point of saturation, right? So we just stay on the same course with our, our call centers, our contact centers, and you know, 200 million blogs out there, customers can't get to them anyway, right? It's, it, it's too much to use and digest. Uh, au contraire, with search, you can get to anything in two seconds flat. I bought a, uh, a portable hard drive, uh, was it yesterday? This is the day before yesterday. And like most of us, 80 plus percent say the studies, uh, most of us, uh, before we make any kind of significant purchase, we'll go and look at what others are saying, we'll look at the reviews. And I did that, and for the most part, uh, they were really good on this one product that I was looking at. There were a few that were really bad, and I went in and, and uh, read the bad ones, and one of them was, you know, this, this guy had a failure, and his data got corrupted in transfer, and, and it was pretty bad. And uh, I, I looked below the, the, um, the comments he had made, and there was a post by the company. We... Are, are very sorry for this experience. It was, it was worded really well. We, we, we apologize for this experience. It's not typical. We're here for you. Uh, we'll, we'll do anything we can to help resolve this for you and prevent this. And, and it was great. It gave me some assurance, and along with the overwhelming positive comments, I went ahead and bought uh, that, that particular brand and product. Uh, another experience, um, I had a wireless phone in my home that was giving me trouble a while back. And uh, like most of us, I went to search first, and I plugged in the product uh, model number and, and some comments, and voila, these five or six pages pop up. And another customer had uh, described the same problem and how he had, he had resolved it. So several years ago, search has surpassed 800 numbers as the most common entry point into, into providing service. Well, I have a question, Brad. You bet. Um, should a company be involved? Should they make a post um, when another person outside the company answers a question? Yeah, even if they answer it you know, correctly, like this wireless example, yes, because it's predictive for customers. They uh, get the assurance that, hey, this company's out there. They, they're listening. They really get it. So next time I'm buying a similar product, I'm going to think of that brand. You know, they're out there where they need to be. Now, obviously, there's some social norms here. If if a post is between two people and it would look, uh, you know, a bit spooky for a big company to jump into the conversation, I, you know, we're, we're obviously being very sensitive to social norms. But a lot of these are public posts. 
public forums, and it's expected, and it's a real wow. It's a real courtesy uh, and a real wow for them to be out there. So, yeah, thanks for throwing that in, Christina. It's okay. one we, we, we tend to get. So I want to look at six trends with you uh, in this context, and the first is uh, – is the conversation, um, the interactions, the conversation has moved beyond the confines of the channels that we've had in the past. And it's opening up amazing opportunities for us to build our brand and really interact in, in ways that we haven't in the past to get the most from our, our customer service, our customer operations investments. Anybody can and anybody should be moving in this direction. This is just an example from uh, NCI, the National Cancer Institute, and if it's a little too small to read where you're where you're sitting, um, it, it's a colorectal cancer uh, example. And I chose NCI because you know they they, they don't probably come to mind as a, a, a high tech or entre entrepreneurial sort of company who might be in, uh, real involved in social channels. Uh, they they've got to be very methodical, make sure their answers are, are, are very appropriate, but their call center, working with a, a content team, is out interacting in these different social channels um, in Spanish and English, and uh, here someone says, uh, hemp oil cures cancer. They're able to say, no, that's that's not often quite the case, and here's some resources for you. Very appropriate. It's a very sensitive subject. If you go look at some of their other posts, they're in many cases, it's, just, it's, it's heartwarming how, how good of a job they're doing. So if an organization like that can be out there and harnessing their customer service operations, which in the, in the past was focused on the traditional channels, and they still are, but focused only on the traditional channels and one-on-one -on -one interactions, we've got a real opportunity to harness that, that potential today. And that's a second trend. Uh, of, of these six that I want to look at with you. Um, there has never been a more important and necessary time to harness the capability of our contact centers. We can potentially produce value on three levels, and historically we've always had this potential. Uh, the first is no surprise. If our customers need to interact with an agent, uh, with a person, call centers are a very efficient way to, to deliver that service because we're pooling resources and we're cross-training agents. Uh, we've got the tools and resources to to do that and to scale as the workload uh, ebbs and flows. But we've realized this kind of parallels the historical development. Realized somewhere along the way that hey, we do a great job. We're going to measurably boost the customer satisfaction and loyalty of those customers we're interacting with. It's this third level capturing using the voice of the customer that's that's getting so much attention and has so much opportunity for us right now. And I, I know Greg's going to pick up with some of this in his discussion here in a bit uh, on voice of the customer and enterprise feedback management. Uh, but look at very different kinds of organizations, probably many on this call who are, who are moving in this direction. But just to mention two very different kinds of organizations, uh, New York City uh, does a good job of capturing why their constituents are calling, what the reasons are, what they're saying. Um, Mayor Bloomberg's called it that, along with the stats program they use to analyze this information, the most powerful management tool the city has. Pretty, uh, pretty compelling statement from someone who's been in the information services uh, business. Uh, his, you know, his. Uh, Entire recent recent life, anyway, recent professional life. Um, wow, a lot of a lot of potential there. Um, to use a very different example, Amazon.com has for years referred to their call center as a research and development machine, an R and D machine. Why are people calling? Why do they need to interact with us? What can we do to improve our website, our processes, our communication to uh, really uh, move our our services in the right direction? When we do that, when we capture that intelligence, that customer input at level three, really harness voice of the customer, we're impacting the first two levels. And here's a real easy and quick example of how these three levels work together. I did some work for a consumer products company a while back, and they have, we probably all have some of their products in our respective uh, utility rooms, but they, one of their products is a cleaning uh, product that they had a cap, a child-proof cap that was hard to get off, so, so their customers would buy it, take it home, and they, they'd end up forcing the cap 
it would all, all too often break the the uh, little spray mechanism, so it would render it useless. And most would throw it away, make a mental note not to buy that brand again. Thank goodness for the relatively small percent of customers who uh, contacted the organization to give them a piece of their mind. And at level two, the organization was able to fix the, you know, was able to to, to address their situation with uh, coupons for other products and apologize, thank them for the for, for the feedback. At level three, they went out to their packaging supplier and said, hey, we're at 11 percent. was the number they came up with. 11 percent of the calls we're getting on this product are because of the cap. Nothing else. Just the, the cap is, is hard to remove, and, and it's breaking the, the, the spray mechanism. So the packaging supplier redesigned the, the, the product, and with that, they had an impact on the first two levels uh, in a very powerful way. Obviously, efficiency improved when those calls went away, when those interactions went away, and they were baking in a higher level of customer satisfaction and loyalty uh, to the product. We talk about things like first contact resolution, and that's good, and we need to keep it, uh, and we need to, to give it its, its due attention, but even more powerfully, are we impacting our customer base and our prospects beyond the interactions that we ever get, because in most organizations, those we're interacting with just represent a, a portion of our total customer base. A third trend is that we're um, quite happily, I believe, being <clears throat> compelled to reshape our customer access strategy. We've, and, and a lot of are doing this on kind of an ad hoc, uh, somewhat informal and by necessity basis, but we want to get methodical about this, really get a cross-functional team put in place to step back and look at all of the channels that we have and the, those that we may need to begin rolling out and ask ourselves, how do we provide uniform, consistent service as an organization uh, across and through these channels? If we don't, we become out of line. We're we're out of alignment probably with with what customers expect, the experience they expect. Internally, uh, as well, these different channels can kind of start coalescing around different parts of the organization. So we may have mobile apps and self-service begin to kind of coalesce around IT, and uh, social channels may be kind of coalesced around uh, marketing, who still very much needs to be involved, but if they turn into customer service uh, providers, they tend to have to begin to grow sort of a quasi-call center, and it begins to zap their resources, and and uh, it's something we've got to step back and look at across the board. Um, so, so, Brad, um, with all of these emerging channels, do you recommend that they be part of existing agent groups? or that they be maybe a new agent group within the contact center? Let me give two answers to that. Um, long term, <clears throat> I recommend that they're, they're part of existing agent groups. Okay. There's so many ways to slice and dice our agent groups. Um, we may have different agent groups by geography, by, by, by products, by um, what else, customer segments perhaps. And so if we're also you know, creating these these divisions by channel, um, we're we're probably creating so many variables that it just becomes so complex to manage. Mm -hmm. And we've got to forecast and staff for every one of these different agent groups that we have. There really is no such thing as a call center. It's an agent group ultimately that uh, is a part of a call center that we're planning around that really matters. So. Long term, I believe we've got to have agent groups that can handle the full range of channels. Now, the other answer is this. From a practical perspective, most aren't doing that initially. You launch something like web chat or maybe a video service, which is beginning to become more common, or you know, text some new channel, and you're probably setting up a subset uh, a crack team of agents to handle just that channel. And that's okay initially. I'm, I'm fine with that. Just keep your eye on the prize and, and know that long term you're going to want to begin to enfold these channels into your you know, more normal agent group structure. Does that make, does that make sense, Christina? Yes, it does. It's a Thank great you. question. So when we talk about a customer access strategy, we're looking at these components specifically. 
who are our customers, why are they interacting with us, you know, sales and service, and you can get very specific with, with types of interactions. And then access channels that we'd open up, all right, how are they going to get to the information that they need, um, <clears throat> what service levels do we need to establish, and so forth. It's a very specific process, very specific order that we'd want to go through um, with that cross-functional team that's going to include the call center and IT and marketing and, you know, keep it as, as small as possible just for practicality purposes, but, but we want representation from across the board to, to really think through the, these components. Intuit, who makes financial software, accounting software, went through this process, and uh, in their consumer group who really spearheaded this, and in their, in their accounting professional division, uh, they, they discussed the um, the possibility for a, a forum, a, a group uh, of of, um, of uh, customers, a customer community, and decided let's really give this a uh, let's, let's really give this a push. And so they programmed right into their software the ability to click out into a forum, a community of other users. And it has taken off. Um, it, it's just been amazing what's happened. Ninety-four percent of the answers uh, to questions in the accounting professional division group, for example, come from the community itself. Fourteen percent, um, their, their call volume has dropped by fourteen percent during peak season. Why not ninety-something percent? Uh, it's because they're growing the traffic. I mean, when you when you create a great service, customers will use more of it. It's that econ 101 principle of elasticity. So they're they're asking a lot more questions, but the customer loyalty and the retention rate in the product has gone way up. So their call center agents are a part of moderating the community. Uh, they help write and polish FAQ documents. And the calls that get through to the agents, uh, that, that have to go through to the agents, I say calls, the interactions of various channels, they're more complex than ever. And as Todd Hicks and one of their managers puts it, their agents have become problem solvers, not just answer givers. And I believe that is a indicative of where, our, where any uh, contact center is going as we, as we progress. A fourth trend is a big effort to pull all interactions into plans and processes. Customers, and as you look at this, I'm not suggesting you need to have, or, or nobody does have, that I know of yet, has every one of these channels. Um, but we're moving in that direction, and there, there are probably one or two or more that you're, uh, you're contemplating adding to the mix you already have in the near future. That's that's certainly a trend uh, defining our, 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 our profession right now. So we've got to pull all of these interactions into our plans and processes. Serving customers is about matching supply and demand. And the uh, first thing we'd want to look at is that service level column. What are, what are those interactions that we have to handle as they occur? And uh, the, the, the others aren't any, necessarily any less important from a content perspective, but they give us a little more leeway in planning. But we've got to know, first and foremost, what do we need to be there for at 10.52 a.m. When, when the contacts are, are, are barreling in? I get teased for using this, uh, the, this or a, a similar uh, table because I think I have in every discussion I've ever had in the last 20 years. So now I have to, right? It's become a, a personal brand thing. There's a reason, though, I, I, I put this in. This is a look at the heart and soul of ultimately what a contact center does. We match resources with demand so that we, we can get on to the things that really matter. Voice of the customer and the higher level objectives that we have will never happen uh, if we are out of balance on our resources. So this will always be, in a, and it's more important now than, than ever uh, in, our, in our planning environment in our operations. This is probably, this may be a bit tough to see depending on where you are, but if you look down three or four rows, um, just to use this example, we've got 250 customer interactions, so we need something like 34 or 35 agents to, to handle that. And if you look clear out to the right, those numbers in the middle of the table represent customers who are waiting a certain number of seconds, so five seconds, 10, 15, 20, you know, 60, 120. 
If you look across that table, you can see that with, let's say, 34 agents, which gives us about an 80% answer in, in, uh, in 20 seconds, we've only got one customer who's waiting three minutes. Nobody's waiting longer than that. That one customer, by the way, is the chairman of the board checking on service. But uh, in any case, that's the worst case. Uh, if you look up to a, a row above that, uh, you'll see with 30 or 31 agents, there are dozens and dozens of customers waiting you know, many minutes. And that illustrates so well the fragile balance that we have between resources and the, the customer requirements that are coming along, especially with our always-on, always-connected environment out there. So, so, Brad, in terms of um, the balance, you, you've always stressed that these issues with scheduling and, and planning must be understood by everybody. Is that, is that, do you still think that way about that? More than ever. When, when, we've, got these new social, when we've got these social channels and, and new kinds of work emerging, um, that balance is as important as ever. And, yes, when, when, when our colleagues in marketing, when our colleagues in IT and other operations areas really understand, when, when senior level management understands how important it is to find that, um, that right staffing level uh, to serve our customers as those needs come up, it tends to give more weight to, you know, internal communication and are we putting out the, the right messages at the right time? Are we, are we supporting the contact center as we need to? You bet. A fifth trend, and this will be no surprise, is that we're building teams that are ready and able for this new era. Uh, these are not entry-level jobs anymore, if they ever were. You know, think of the Intuit example, problem solvers, not answer givers. Um, so with automation and social and mobile apps and all of the capabilities that are becoming a part of the customer service mix, those interactions we're handling are more complex and more important than ever, and that puts a premium on recruiting and hiring and training and setting you know, the right kind of career paths to keep people around and really building that skill and, and capability level. So in terms of building these teams, what criteria would you recommend for hiring? Is um, the right technical know-how, is something like that important, or what do you think? Uh, yeah, it's a very important question. And I, I had the director of a mobile phone company one time tell me, and I'll, I'll never I'll forget this, um, he said, and, and he, he, had, he had done such a great job and helped grow the organization's market share and their, their customer f um, feedback was, was, uh, was terrific and, and he had a, a very engaged team, didn't have a whole lot of turnover, people loved to work there. He, I, I asked him, what, what's your secret? He said, well, Brad, my secret is I hire the passion and train the skills. Hmm. I hire the passion, I train the skills. He wasn't saying go out and hire people that have no background, no skill, you know, starting from, from zero. He wasn't saying that. He's saying you have the most technical, most capable person uh, imaginable, and if they don't have that passion, that sparkle in their eye for serving customers and creating a great experience, it's probably not going to go as well as it could. It's definitely important, that passion. One more trend, um, and really the, the culmination of the others, um, is that we are learning as a profession, as an industry, to create more and more, cultivate more and more business value. Very exciting. Think of the, the third-level voice of the customer capturing the kind of input that can help improve products and services and processes. And when we do that, when we see every interaction not just as a, a transaction to, to optimize an efficiency, but as an opportunity to use that that uh, interaction and the intelligence that we're we're gleaning from it to impact our entire customer base and prospects beyond them, um, we begin to really impact the things that matter most at the highest levels and the things that are going to create a healthy organization and. and uh, uh, sustain us going forward. Um, you think of the revenue of a of a Zappos, um, and they they're not Zappos is not selling. They're they're so often used as a great example, and they deserve it. But they're they're not selling 
something you can't get elsewhere. You know, it's not like a Google or a, a Facebook or something where you, you know, there's there's no, um, perhaps no alternative that immediately comes to mind. It's not so true with search. There's lots of alternatives. But Zappos has, uh, they, they sell a commodity, and they've used service to differentiate. So it's such a powerful example. Zero to a billion in, you know, seven or eight years. Uh, think of the cost control of New York City as they analyze the, the relatively small sample vis-a-vis their constituency and use it to help prioritize and provision resources. Um, the brand loyalty of a, you know, American Express or Apple. And we can begin to see, wow, this, this is, uh, this is a time for customer service and contact centers in particular to shine. Uh, we've got, um, so much potential to, continue to further and cultivate our strategic uh, impact. Very exciting. So I'll leave you, leave you with this um, little bit of homework. Um, if, uh, if you'll get a team around a table and just go through these questions specifically, where are you in becoming a part of the conversation? You're really listening across some of the channels out there and, and uh, First and foremost, listening, and then then uh, you can determine how to how to follow up and act on that. Um, harnessing voice of the customer, right through cultivating business value, and I I think I can safely promise there will be some really interesting um, discussion items and probably to do uh, items that come out of that. And these are the trends that uh, that that will continue to define uh, and shape. Uh, our profession and our contact centers going forward. So with that, Christina, I'll turn this back over to you, and we'll hand it over to uh, Greg. Great. Thank you so much, Brad. These are some really great trends, and there's really so much for us to be looking forward to. Um, Just a quick reminder to our audience, we'll be taking questions for our speakers at the end of the presentation, but you can continue to submit them at any time. And now I will turn the presentation over to Greg. Thanks, Christina, and thanks, um, Brad. That was some really interesting information and a lot of great trends that um, I'll actually kind of be touching on in my portion of the presentation. I'm going to specifically address um, how to harness that voice of the customer in the contact center to really make it a strategic asset and turn the contact center um, into a strategic part of any business um, by using voice of the customer to improve the customer experience and overall customer relationship specifically using what's called an Enterprise Feedback Management Solution, or EFM, as a shorthand. So let's take a second to talk about the you know, traditional approaches of collecting and management, managing feedback. So I'm sure many people in the listening audience um, have some basic survey tools um, that they may compile responses into spreadsheets for analysis, um, but that really fails to deliver the type of results that will turn a contact center into um, a strategic part of the business. Um, It's fraught with a lot of difficulties. There are silos of feedback. So you may have feedback on a particular agent group or a particular product line or a particular department, but it's really difficult to get um, feedback talking to one another, if you will, across departments, across groups, et cetera. Reporting is often delayed because um, we have other things on our plates, and unless it's your full-time job, to be managing and analyzing um, feedback and creating spreadsheets in a contact center, it's sometimes difficult to find the time to actually cull through all of the uh, verbatim responses, make sense of it, et cetera. So sometimes reports are delivered, you know, weeks if not months after the actual feedback is gathered, and by then you've changed reps, you've changed products, you've done additional trainings, so then the um, information is somewhat suspect by that point. And the last two, irrelevant data and overwhelming data, the first, irrelevant data is common, and we see that commonly when we initially engage with customers because they just don't know what questions to ask. So they're asking a whole bunch of questions, gathering a whole bunch of random feedback, if you will, and much of it is irrelevant because it's not the type of information they need in order to take action to improve the customer experience. And then overwhelming data is something that Brad certainly touched on, especially with um, social media and blogs, you know, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. There are just volumes and volumes and volumes of information and feedback, and it's difficult if you're using a basic survey tool that doesn't capture 
those channels of feedback um, to really paint a complete picture of what's going on. So this next slide is something that I like to use a lot in sort of um, getting a benchmark of where people are. So um, because of the problems we just discussed with basic survey tools and spreadsheets, very few organizations actually are able to close the loop on customer feedback, which means actually making changes to business processes, et cetera, based on customer feedback, and then getting back to the customer and letting them know that their feedback mattered and here's what the company did to address the customer's feedback. So um, I'm sure most of you in the audience are collecting feedback. So we talked about, you know, basic survey tools, spreadsheets, et cetera. Um, almost all companies today are collecting feedback in some way, even if it's just um, agent notes from a phone call, et cetera. So collection happens. That's a given. But fewer than half of companies surveyed, and actually this comes from some Gartner research from a couple years back, um, about half of the organizations share that information with their staff, which is somewhat surprising, but we see it again and again in customers when we initially engage with them on their voice of the customer um, programs. So in many cases, the feedback will be with the management team or with executives, but it's really not in the hands of supervisors or frontline agents to really and, – and those are the people who can actually – use that information the most to change what they're doing in order to improve a customer experience and actually benefit from that feedback. Um, so then if we look at using the insight, um, using the insight, an example of that would be using the information for training. So if the customer feedback is that your reps were not as knowledgeable as the customer thought they should be, well, you can certainly explore what areas of knowledge they're lacking and implement some training. So that's using the insight to improve the process. And here again, if we look back to the previous one, sharing the information with staff, well, a supervisor is not going to know that he or she needs to um, improve training if that feedback is not shared with the employees at that level. Making changes. So you can see a, a dramatic drop off between using the insight and making changes. So making changes means actually using the feedback to change a business process, to change an operational um, process for efficiency, et cetera. It might be making a change to a website, changing the navigation based on customer input. It might be changing a data entry form or an application that a um, customer may need to complete. So only about 15% of the companies surveyed actually used the feedback data to make a change to a business process. And then you'll see that last bar, only, you know, fewer than 10% of the organization, organization surveyed actually closed the loop with the customer. So even if they did make changes based on customer feedback, of those who made changes based on feedback, only half of those actually got back to the customers to say, hey, your feedback mattered. Um, we made the change that you suggested, and we'd like your feedback on the new form, et cetera. So just really fascinating, and we see this again and again with many organizations that come to us looking for help with their voice of the customer um, initiatives. So here we have a poll question. We'd like to just get a read on where your organization is on what I call this customer feedback continuum. So if you could take um, some time to actually Choose where you think you are, collecting feedback stage. Do you actually share the feedback with staff and employees at all levels? Do you use the insight you collect to improve your business operations? Do you make changes to processes or systems based on the feedback? And do you actually close the loop and get back to the customers who provided the feedback in the first place? So let's take about 30 seconds to give you an opportunity to respond. Don't be shy. You can submit. <laughs> All right, Greg, I'm going to push these results out so that everybody can see them. Very interesting. All right, so everybody yeah, is collecting feedback. Yes, pretty consistent with what we see again and again that 
everybody collects feedback and it sort of ends there. And you're never going to create strategic value in a contact center by just collecting feedback and not actually taking action on it to improve your customer's experience. Um, so quickly, I'll go through the next few slides. We talked about some of the challenges of collecting feedback. There are silos of feedback across the enterprise. So, you know, thinking about different audiences, you're not only interested in what your customers have to say, but how about your partners and even employee feedback is very valuable for understanding how to improve systems and processes, et cetera. Multiple touch points. There are multiple touch points within a contact center, and then you have a customer touch point with sales reps or marketing organizations, you know, at trade shows and events, et cetera. Different life cycle events. There's pre-sale support and questions. There's maybe installation. If you have the type of um, business where a technician might go and install a product, um, you might have post-installation questions, et cetera. So many different life cycle events that you'd want to get um, feedback on to understand how you're doing and how the customer perceives the service. Um, different part departments, of course, across an organization, sales, marketing, product development, et cetera, and then a multitude of feedback channels that really have grown over the past few years including you know, survey, um, surveys are pretty traditional, but including social media, um, call recordings, text analytics, for example, is something new over the past few years. And again, when you're talking about simple surveys and spreadsheets, you're not going to be able to harness feedback from these multiple channels. And because of this, it's really you know, costly and you have disconnected insights, et cetera, if you're stuck in that just feedback collection mode, which it seems like most of us um, on the webinar are. And this is from a Harris survey, um, just something to keep in mind that um, they found that just a 5% increase in customer loyalty can lead to an up to an 85% increase in profits, which of course is logical because your customers who are loyal are telling others about you and your products and how great the service experience was. They come back to you again to buy more products, services, etc. And then the other thing to keep in mind in today's world is that um, 86 percent responded in this Harris survey that they would leave a company after one bad experience, and 82 percent said they would tell others about it. And it's important to keep in mind when we say tell others about it, it's just not telling a couple friends. In today's world, a bad experience can be um, communicated to dozens, if not hundreds, of people on Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. And I think we all you know, may remember about a year ago a famous example of a mommy blogger who had a bad experience with her Maytag. Um, I think it was a washing machine, and she blogged about how incredibly unresponsive the customer service people were, et cetera, et cetera. And this went on for weeks until it turned into a huge news event and embarrassment for Whirlpool. And if they had had an uh, enterprise feedback management system where they're collecting feedback from multiple channels, including Bob blogs, they would have been able to get a handle on this much earlier and close the loop um, with this influential blogger before it became an embarrassing um, PR event for them. So let's talk a little bit about these EFM um, solutions and the evolution. Um, many of us will remember back in the 90s there was loyalty consulting services that still exist today where they would come into an organization that wanted to understand um, what sort of customer experience they were um, providing, and they would maybe do phone surveys, they would maybe mail out paper surveys, you know, with a small incentive to the customer to complete the survey, and it would take sometimes months just to get the feedback back, and then it would take months to analyze all the feedback, read all the verbatim responses, group them by common themes, create, you know, a 100-page, 200-page report with a lot of cross-tabs. In most cases, they would present to the management team, and that would be the end of it. Um, never shared the information with broad employees. And in most cases, the information was so stale, by the time they got the reports, again, things had changed dramatically. The company had launched new products. They had a turnover in management, a turnover in agents, for example, in a, in a contact center, and then just didn't know how to implement any of the changes recommended in the report. So that brings us to the 2000s, where we saw that first generation of easy-to-use surveys, where people were able to survey based on a touch point, et cetera. But here again, it was very difficult to get a full 360-degree view, if you will, of the customer experience. So you 
not looking at um, every single touch point across every department, you know, et cetera. So in today's enterprise feedback management solutions, they handle high volume transactional surveys plus relationship surveys. You might want to know, get a pulse on your high value customers or a certain segment of customers, you know, once a year, twice a year, and then match that with transactional surveys to see how consistent the results are. Um, these sorts of systems, enterprise feedback management solutions, are ideal for contact centers because they're high volume. They can um, collect feedback and analyze responses from all feedback channels, including social media. You can integrate with ERP, CRM, and other business systems. So, for example, if you want to match and analyze survey responses from a particular segment of customers or a particular segment of customers who own a particular product, or if you want to look at purchasing history and match that against feedback responses, all of that is possible with an enterprise feedback management solution. Um, the leading EFM solutions like CustomerSat, which is something that my company, Market Tools, offers, allows you to really consolidate all these silos of feedback into a single source of insight and really solves all those problems we identified um, in that first slide. So you can collect feedback across multiple channels. Um, there are sophisticated analysis and reporting within the system that you would never be able to replicate on a simple spreadsheet. And you can monitor every single touch point that the customer um, experiences with your organization. And just a really great way to have a single integrated solution that also allows you to share the information across employees and allows you to take action on that feedback. So it allows you to get to that last point in the customer feedback continuum, which is actually closing the loop with customers. So you can actually set up alert systems, um, cases, case management within the system. So you can set business rules, for example, if, if anybody answers below a certain score on a survey, that immediately spawns an alert which goes to a frontline manager so they can immediately address the issue and follow up with the customer before it becomes an experience like the example I gave with the mommy blogger and her, you know, whirlpool um, experience. So things like that would be nipped in the bud, if you will, and you'd be able to recapture customers who are at risk for um, losing your business. And I mentioned sophisticated reporting. Um, in our product, for example, Market Tools Customer Stat, we have what we call adaptive role-based reporting. So you can set up personalized reports based on a particular level of an organization. So you can set up reports for specific agents, um, to supervisors, to executives within the organization, and they're seeing the, um, they're actually seeing the feedback that is most relevant to their role and feedback that they can immediately use to take action and improve their interactions with the customers. Um, so I wanted to give you one example of how our customers put an EFM solution to work. Um, American General Life Companies is one of the major um, insurance providers in the U.S., and they came to us. They were collecting feedback, like most of us in the audience. Um, but they, again, they had silos. They had conflicting feedback. They weren't sure which of their customers were touching each of their different business units. So they wanted to bring that all together in a comprehensive solution and get feedback across all of their major business areas. So we created touch point surveys with them. We worked with them on the questions to ask, set up the reporting for them, so they could share the feedback across all employees, um, and they really integrated the feedback throughout all the business units. And their results within the first 12 months was that just based on the feedback that they were compiling in the enterprise feedback management solution, they saved approximately a quarter of a million dollars um, in cost reductions. Um, they were able to improve their first call resolution scores by 45% because they learned through the feedback that they needed to improve agent training in very specific areas that they wouldn't have known without that specific feedback. And they were better able to pinpoint and save at-risk customers by implementing an alerting system similar to the example I gave. Um, so they were really able to demonstrate strategic value to the business um, by implementing the EFM solution within the contact center. And in fact, you know, I'm very happy to report that right now we're working with American General Life to expand the relationship going beyond the four business areas that are listed here um, into international divisions and other units within the American General Life company. So um, a huge success for American General Life. 
Um, this slide here is just a summary of some of our other customers, along with some results that they're experiencing um, with an enterprise feedback management solution. Um, Wind River, which is an Intel company out here in the Bay Area, they have actually identified 110 business processes that they were able to improve and streamline and save money on based on feedback that they gathered from the enterprise feedback management solution in their contact center. So enormous strategic value to the organization um, at Wind River. Um, then I'll just summarize by, you know, answering why Market Tools customer sat. So we've worked with customers for over a dozen years now. I've worked with over, you know, close to 2 billion surveys now um, over the course of the decade or so we've been working in voice of the customer programs. We've generated thousands and thousands of programs for hundreds and hundreds of companies, um, and we've been profitable. Actually, I should have updated this slide for the past 15 quarters. And um, just recently, Market Tools was named a leader among EFM satisfaction and loyalty solutions vendors by Forrester, the leading um, research firm. And that um, report is available on our website, so I would, uh, if you're interested, encouraging you um, to download that and read a little bit about our solution and the entire EFM um, space. All right, so I hope that was helpful, giving a little bit of insight about how an enterprise feedback management solution can really help you harness voice of the customer and create um, a strategic center, if you will, within your contact center. Now I'll turn it over to Christina. Thanks so much, Greg. And I just want to re-push the poll results. We've got a lot of questions um, and a lot of answers came in after. I guess we were a little too quick. So here's the results since then. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, great. And this is actually what I would have expected. I would have expected that this audience, based on the um, fact that they are, have interest in the topic and are on this webinar, would have been more toward the latter part of the customer feedback continuum, but you can still see here that only 13% are closing the loop on that feedback. Only a third are making changes based on feedback, so there's certainly a lot of room for improvement here. And this group, Greg, is actually ahead of the market in general, right? Oh, by far, yes, by far. And I would expect that, you know, given the topic of the webcast, but still, you know, this is consistent with, um, again, what an enterprise feedback management system can help these organizations move down that continuum very effectively. Okay, well, thank you. So we have a few minutes left before we need to close out. So I'm going to um, open up the Q&A. We've got a lot of great questions in here. Um, I'm not sure if we'll be able to address them all, but we'll, we'll get to them after. Um, I do have one here for Greg, and the question is, typically, how long does it take to implement an EFM system? Yeah, so that's a great question because um, um, uh, most customers will want to know, well, if we embark upon this path, how long is it going to take? So um, I should have mentioned on my slide about Market Tools customer set, typically we can get a customer up and running and actually even making changes based on feedback they're collecting within about six to eight weeks. Um, which I know sounds unbelievably fast, but we have, that's our typical time frame, and we have, you know, dozens of customers that have experienced that. There is a, you know, a week or two of actually planning, so um, helping you understand what your touch points are, the types of questions you might want to ask um, before we actually launch the first initiative, but typically it's really only, you know, six to eight weeks, so a very um, short time frame. It's a SaaS solution, so there's no software to install, you know, et cetera. So, yeah, six to eight weeks is common. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, we have another question in here, which is was directed to Brad, but I think Brad and Greg may have something to contribute. Um, the question is, how do you sell marketing on the contact center to handling the social channel? They, they <laughs> seem to see it as something they own, but... That, that's a great question. I, there, there's a good reason that marketing is involved and needs to we, – we want them to continue. We need for them to continue to be involved. These are um, real high-level brand impacts that we're, uh, that, that we're having, but they, they, tend to, they tend to sell themselves on the need for the call center to get – get involved because they get overwhelmed with customer service issues. Uh, it's not just the messaging we're putting out. 
So these are real live, it's like the hard drive I bought. These are real live customer service issues. We've got to have scalability. We've got to have an operation to help support that. So they love it when we, in the end, make that transition. And they need to be a part of that team, but the call center is the engine for interaction and, and like, into it, um, helping push along FAQs and, and, and discussion points and capture information for our, our knowledge system and, and so forth. That's the, that's the angle I would take in short. Say so we, we can help. We're not trying to pull this out of your out of your greedy hands. We're we're trying to help here, and this is yeah. an organization wide issue. Yeah, and we and we see that um, with our customers that once they've implemented an EFM solution and see that they're able to consolidate the feedback and analyze it in one system, if you think of it as another customer touch point, another channel of feedback, just like a phone call into a contact center or an email into a contact center, we find that over time the marketing organizations are more than happy um, to have the contact center own the channel just like any other channel and respond to the customer issues, queries. Marketing likes to be involved, so they may be one of the departments on the reporting that you set up in the Market Tools customer stat, for example. Um, so they want to keep abreast of it, and again, an EFM solution is a great way for you to be able to analyze and take action on that feedback within the contact center, but use reporting um, and other analysis to keep marketing on top of what's happening. Okay, great. Thank you, Brad, and thank you, Greg. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. There were so many great questions. Um, I wish we could get to them all, but rest assured we will be presenting everything um, after, the, after the webinar. I just want to take a quick moment now to mention that the third edition of Brad's book, Call Center Management on Fast Forward, Succeeding in the New Era of Customer Relationships, is currently available in print and e-formats. So if you haven't gotten your copy yet, you can find it through icmi.com. And following this presentation, you can stay in touch with Brad and Greg with any additional questions that you might have. So please be sure to visit icmi.com to find out about our related training or upcoming webinars, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Shortly after today's live event, you can access this presentation on demand. This webcast is copyright 2012 by ICMI. The presentation materials are owned by or copyright, if that is the case, by ICMI, which is solely responsible for its content and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. So on behalf of our guests and our sponsor, Market Tools, thank you for joining us today.